First Kings chapter number two. We'll begin reading verse number one. The Bible says, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth, be thou strong therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me, in truth, with all their heart and with all their soul, they shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, and to Abner, the son of Ner, and to uh, Amana, or Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew, and shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle, that was about his loins, and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom, and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace. We'll stop reading there. Now, just timeline wise, we get to David's about ready to go off the scene. David is still king. Okay, but David knows he's not going to be king for much longer. That's why he says, I go the way of all the earth. What's that? Well, we're all cursed. We all got to go to the grave cursed by sin and he says hey my time's about up let me give you a little bit of sound advice here okay well first off he says and keep the charge of the Lord thy God pretty good advice okay but he encourages them not only to keep the charge but to walk in the Lord's ways to keep his statutes his commandments his judgments his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses in other words he's not just saying know it he's saying keep the charge of the Lord. That means preserve the things of God. Right? That also means the charge of the king of Israel to be the figurehead spiritually for the entire nation. He's saying, you got a lot of responsibility now, Solomon, but keep the charge. Don't let it go by the wayside. Always be in remembrance. God puts you here to do what God wanted you to do for all of Israel. Okay, then he says the statutes. Well, what are statutes? Those are principles. Right? Those are what nowadays we'd call biblical standards. Right? Things that we do because they're the right thing to do. Can't go wrong doing right. Okay, then there's commandments. That means don't sin. Because right? there's a difference between statute and a, com a commandment. Then it's his judgments. Well, it may not be sin, but do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Exercise discernment. Right? Well, in the New Testament we find verses such as abstain from the appearance of all evil you got to use a little bit of judgment there. It may not be wrong. It may not go against a commandment. right? It may not be one of the statutes of God that separates us from the world, but deep down in the gable end of your soul, the Holy Spirit says, you know, we shouldn't do that. Because it may give somebody the wrong impression. Okay, well, then it's his testimonies. What's that? That's his praises. That's the worship. Right, preserving the things in the house of God that testify to how great God really is. As it's written in the law of Moses, that thou may prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest us up. In other words, you do that, God's going to make you successful. You're going to be prosperous. But most importantly, you're going to do what God wants you to do. Okay, then verse number four. Okay, that the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me. Well, what was that word? That if... The one that God anointed to be king did what God told him to do. God would make the one on the throne. You know, he would establish him there. Nobody would be able to remove him. But then also, the whole nation would prosper. God's people would be successful. Okay, but then, verse number five. I mean, think of this. This is not the last thing, but this is one of the things David is really drilling into Solomon before he's ready to go off the scene. I mean, the Everything that we've read so far, that makes sense. Right? Just one, one last time, drill it into his head. Hey, do what God tells you to do. But in the middle of that lesson, we see something that looks a little bit out of context. He's talking about do what God tells you to do. God's going to fulfill his word that he promised me. I mean, part of that is, hey, I laid up all them supplies over there. Go build the greatest you know, edifice that's ever been built that they called Solomon's Temple. 
Go build God the house that God deserves in the land of his own people. Go build a temple that truly magnifies how great our God is. I mean, he's talking about great stuff. And then out of nowhere, hey, watch out for this guy named Joab. He thought it was so important that after one more time, just reminding him how great God had been to David, how great God could be to Solomon, he says, hey, moreover thou knowest also what Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me. And then what did he do? Well, he slew the two captains of the host of Israel, Abner and uh, uh, Amasa. Then, there's more that he went into, but on those two occasions it says that he slew them with the act of war in a time of peace. He said, didn't have a right to kill him, and he killed him anyway. What's that? He murdered him. Amen. Then, verse number six, says do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace but what's that h-o-a-r what's that mean it means prideful it means defiant it means self-righteous okay well who was Joab Joab's David's nephew Zeruiah that's David's sister and David's sister had a son. Well, she, actually, she had three sons. We'll get to them in a little bit. But one of those sons was Joab. Now, Joab, way back, I mean, we can go all the way back to, you know, 2 Samuel, okay? But we don't have time to get through all of 2 Samuel so that we can get to 1 Kings, okay? It's a big book, right? We, we can't do that in one Sunday school. But Joab starts off, he's loyal to David. I mean, it's his uncle. Okay, 2 Samuel comes along. Well, what's happened? Well, Saul's died. Jonathan has died. Israel is scrambling to find a king. Not Judah, because Judah said, Hey, David, God anointed you. We want you as our king. So David ruled in Hebron for a couple of years. Okay, well, Israel's looking for the king to replace Saul. And nobody wants David in Israel as of yet. So, there's this guy named Abner. Well, Abner was Saul's general. Think of him that way. Leader of, the, leader of the armies. And he says, well, the king's dead. And God's killed off a lot of Saul's relatives. So he starts scrambling, looking for a new king. He finds one. It was one of the sons of Saul. Puts him on the throne. Well, then there's conflict. Because you've got two kings over one nation. So which one's the real one? Well, they decided that they were, there was a prearranged date two armies were going to meet each other and then the winner was the winner that one was king didn't check out that way but that was the plan okay well David says well we got to send some men up there to fight who are we going to send Joab volunteers he says I'll go up you're my uncle you're God's man we're going to go get you the throne that God promised you well, he goes up, they fight. Joab on one side leading David's men, Abner on the other side leading men of Saul. Joab and David's men prevail. Abner surrenders. He says, I'm done. I'm good. Stop the, stop the slaughter, right? Save those men that you can. Joab says, okay. And then Abner runs. Well, where did Abner run to? He ran to David. And he groveled before him. He bowed himself down before him and said, hey, I was just doing what I was supposed to do. Keep in mind, this man was a loyal Saul. He was the general. He said, well, I need a king. And who's going to be the next king? Well, the descendant of one of the other kings. He's doing what made sense to him, what he was trained to do. Keep in mind, in Abner's mind, David was a fugitive, he was a criminal, and he stood against the one that Abner had sworn loyalty to. That was Saul. He says, I was, I was just doing... David forgives him. He says, Abner... You surrendered. It's over. Get out of here. Right? Go live a life of peace now. Abner, your struggle is over. No more conflict for you. So Abner leaves David's camp right in Judah. Joab comes back, finds out that Abner had been there. Okay, well, you say, well, hey, what did Abner have to say? Well, David told him, well, I forgave him, and I let him go. 
Joab was angry that David didn't take Abner as prisoner. So you know what Joab did? This verse tells us he went out and stabbed him to death. In a time of peace, Joab's king said, no, you're a free man, and Joab didn't like it. He went out and murdered him. He said, no, 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 no. You deserve to die. Now, why was that? Now, we'll get to that here, but hang on to that. Hang on to that thought. Why did Joab kill Abner? Then the next person in Israel that they found to be general was Amasa. Same kind of thing. Slew him in the time of peace. Right? Not in the time of war. Well, you would think that a guy that is just guilty of committing two murders wouldn't be the general of David's men no more. Right? But David was a forgiving man. David was a loving person. Well, then, the next sort of big speed bump, if you will, in Joab and David's relationship was with a situation concerning one of David's sons named Absalom. We all know Absalom. Absalom was the one that tried to steal the throne away from David. Well, before that, Absalom also had committed murder and fled from David. Well, at that point, Joab wanted to play peacemaker. He said, hey, no, no, no. Absalom, David, we got to get you guys in the same room. We got to work this thing out. Well, eventually, it did work out. Joab went about it in a shady way. But eventually, everything happened. Absalom's forgiven by David. But when Absalom comes back, then he starts stealing the hearts of the people away from David. Then, David has to flee for his own life. And then, one day, God worked it out. Absalom, long curly hair. Bible says, well, I don't know if it was curly, but it was long. And, long hair, Bible says it's an abomination for a man to have long hair, but anyway... Goes out, riding a horse, hair gets caught in a tree. Okay, he's stuck. That's, that's pretty good stuck if your hair catches you in a tree. Okay, I mean, that's, a, that's stuck, stuck. But at that moment, Absalom was still alive. He was helpless. Under current day, that man would be considered a prisoner of war. He's he can't do nothing. He can't attack you. He can't defend himself he's, he's stuck in a tree by his hair okay well what did Joab do Joab killed Absalom he didn't take him down from a tree now we don't know I mean he was caught in a tree could have been paralyzed you riding a horse hair gets caught in a tree that could snap your neck but Absalom is still alive right we know that he killed him then he comes back to tell David, hey, I just found your son that's been trying to overthrow you, and I killed him. And David starts weeping. He's heartbroken. He told Joab not to kill Absalom. Gave him a standing order. And he defied it and killed him. And David's heartbroken. He weeps for him. And then Joab rebukes him for it. How do you yell at a father for crying when you just told him, I killed your son? He says, that guy was trying to rebel against you. He was your enemy. I killed him. Don't shed a tear for him. Kind of heartless. But Joab didn't understand how David could be heartbroken for somebody that betrayed him. Well then, after all that had settled... Joab's no longer the general or the leader of David's army. He was replaced by his brother. His name's Abishai. Okay? Again, another one of David's nephews. But Abishai, one of the brothers of Joab. Joab, is, he's, kind of, he's not expelled, right? They didn't, they didn't kick him out of the country. Okay? He wasn't banned from being in Israel, but he was shunned. David didn't want to have nothing to do with him. And then the third major event in Joab's life comes right after this. Okay, David's telling Joab, or David's telling Solomon, watch out for Joab. You know what he's done in the past. He's still a snake. 
Well, after this, guess what Joab does? Joab, again, he's not, he's not associated with the house of David anymore. That's his family, but he didn't have anything to do with them. So then, when the time comes for David to go off the scene, who's going to be the next king? David has made it adamant. Solomon's the next king. No doubt about it. He says, I don't care who you are. Don't care which one of my other sons you are. God said Solomon's next. But David goes off the scene. And Joab sides with one of the other sons of David and says, I don't want Solomon to be the next king. And then, long story short, Joab, eventually everything gets found out. God took care of it. But then one day, there's a guy by the name of Benaiah. That was the leader of David's personal guards. And Benaiah, the one that you've heard Dad preach about, and thankfully he didn't name me after Benaiah like he wanted to, because I'd still not be able to spell it. But that Benaiah went out and slew Joab. Okay, and that was the end of Joab's tale. Now, a little bit of interesting knowledge for you. Joab, that name, means God is his father. Keep in mind, Joab's mama lived in the same household as David. They was raised together. Now David, man after God's own heart, we've got nearly an entire book of Psalms that were written by him praising and worshiping God. Prayers that he prayed to God in faith, knowing that God would take care of all of his problems, no matter how desperate and desolate it may have seemed. Well, where do you think David learned to worship like that? In the house of his father. Well, where was Joab's mom raised at? Same house David was raised at. Joab's mom knew a little bit about worshiping God. She grew up in the same house as David. I believe she raised him right. She named him. God is this man's father. Don't worry about your earthly father. Only consider your heavenly father. Do as he would have you to do. I believe Joab was raised right. I believe he was instructed right. He sided with the right man, David. They knew that's God's man. And all that he did, I do believe that somewhere in his heart he thought, this is what's best for the king. I honestly believe that. But, Joab, God may have been his father, but he wasn't a child of God. Two different things. You could be related to somebody and have nothing to do with them. That's what happened at the end of Joab's life. Right? You can have an association, but that doesn't mean that you've got a relationship. David was a man after God. David was a child of God. What happens when we get saved? We receive the adoption of sonship. We have the right to a relationship, but not all of us choose to use it. Joab knew about God. Joab had a little bit of faith in God. There was a time, okay, you guys remember Abishai, the one that replaced him? Okay, there was a time, Joab takes a group of men out, and then they're surrounded on both sides by two different groups of enemies and they're outnumbered. A whole lot to a whole little. And everybody looked at Joab and said, well, what are we going to do? And he said, well, Abishai is going to take a group and fight that enemy. I'm going to take a group and fight this enemy. And then we don't have time to go over. Anyway, basically what he ends up saying is we're going to fight and God's going to decide who wins. He's got a little bit of faith in God. He knows that God's got the power that keeps everything in control, that God would have orchestrated it. But let's compare that to David. Joab had a little faith. David went down to Goliath and said that God had delivered him into his hand. Didn't say, we're going to fight and God's going to decide who wins. He said, God's already won the fight and he's going to put you right here in my hand. Just like he did with the bear and the lion. What was David's faith? God's already done the fighting, Goliath. You just don't realize it. 
He says, I may be throwing this rock, but God's the one that's guiding it and going to sink it into your forehead, then smack you upside the back of the head and see you land on your face. But Joab said, we're going to do our best, and then God's going to let whatever happens happen. He says, I believe God's got everything in his hands, but we're going to go out, and I'm going to fight, and then God's just going to decide who wins. David said, God does the fighting for me. Why do you think that the people of Israel said Saul had his thousands, David had his ten thousands? Why was David such a renowned military leader? Because he let God do the fight. When he went to battle, he gave it his all, but he only went to battle when God said go to battle. God honored the stand that Joab made that day, and they did come out victorious. But Joab went in thinking, well, I'm going to fight the hardest that I can. I'm going to do what I know is right, and then I guess God's just going to decide who wins. Well, I'd rather go in knowing that God's got my back in battle than hoping that God has my back in battle. David said the fight was already over before I even walked out of here. Long before Goliath started you know, cussing our God, God had already decided that giant's going to die. So I had a little faith. But again, he knew who God was, didn't have a relationship with him. He didn't understand that God, his father, meant that he could spend time with God. He could worship God. He could have, in Old Testament version of it, a relationship with God. He's one of God's chosen people, Israel. That meant that God was their heavenly father. But Joab wasn't concerned with who his heavenly father was. He knew about him. He knew enough about him to understand that he was God. But he didn't know enough about him to let him fight the battles for him. Didn't know enough about him to understand that David, being God's man, if it came from David, that meant do it. If David was right, if the man of God's right, do what he says. If he's wrong, don't do what he says. There are a lot of kings of Israel that did wrong and shouldn't have followed them. But if he's doing it as us say to the Lord, do it. Joab had a few problems. And those problems, I see are the same problems nowadays in modern day Christians' life. Well, let's start off, let's go back to that first battle. One against Abner. One of the men that Joab slew. Now in that battle, I said, Joab had two brothers. Abishai was the one that replaced him as general. But he had another brother. And I can't say his name. But Joab's second brother died in the battle against Abner. Abner's men slew Joab's brother. And when he got back to camp and found out that David didn't take the man who was responsible for killing his brother captive, he went out and killed him. Joab was okay with being associated with God until it became personal. Until he lost something. That's one of his brothers. His brother went out to fight for the rightful king of Israel so that he could be put on the throne in Jerusalem. He's saying, you know, hey, David, living in caves, on the run for all these years, and y'all still don't want to admit that he's the man of God. I mean, Abishai was one of the ones that when David was called before Saul, Abishai went with him. And then Abishai says, hey, you're going to have an opportunity to kill the king here. You do that, we nip this whole thing in the bud. This is long before David's on the run and everything else. Abishai says, hey, let's do it, man. Let's get this thing going. You're the next king. And David said, I will not touch God's anointing. So, I mean, they've been with Joab, Abishai's brother. They've been with David since the beginning. And all of that boils up into a fight. Joab's got it in his mind. All right, if we beat Abner and his men, David's king. Well, they won. But Joab lost a brother. But what does that translate to nowadays? A lot of Christians are fine until the sacrifices start. Until things don't go according to what we thought God was going to do. And then, when it doesn't go according to what we thought God was going to do, we take it into our own hands. And then notice in our verses, in chapter number 2, 
go down to verse number 5 after it says that unto Amasa the son of Jether whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet you know what he's saying to Solomon there Joab tainted everywhere that he went and everything that he did with the blood of the innocent he's saying his legs were covered and his feet were covered in innocent blood that was shed in a time of peace but he slew him like there was a time of war you know what that meant he left bloody footprints everywhere he went after that he's saying these two Abner and Amasa that started what ended up being the rest of Joab's life it all started there and everything that he did was tainted with the blood of those two men why because he slew them both out of anger out of a David forgave Abner Joab wanted revenge for his lost brother show me where Christ ever took revenge on somebody show me when someone came to God and truly repented that God still held it against them Abner came and said I was wrong David you're the next king I'm done fighting I've cut all ties with Saul's house David said hey go live a life of I forgive you Joab comes back and says well you don't know what he apologized for he apologized for killing my brother and David said I forgave him and Joab said no 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 but you forgave him for being associated with Saul's house and everything you didn't forgive him for doing this David said yeah I did he said it could have been you Joab and I still would have forgiven him why because he asked sincerely to be forgiven he was doing what he thought was right he said now he understands he was wrong aren't you glad that once it's under the blood it's gone but Joab wanted to keep remembering and Abner didn't get to enjoy freedom for all that long because Abner was dead for killing Joab's brother what did that do that was the first step that led him eventually to being killed by Benaiah to being ostracized by his own family well then let's look at Absalom now we said Absalom committed a murder fled from David okay, Joab wanted to bring them together he wanted to get things mended well Joab convinces Absalom to come back to Jerusalem but then he puts him under house arrest Absalom's not allowed to leave not allowed to go anywhere well Absalom keeps sending hey I thought we were going to my dad hey I thought we were going to get this thing made right you've just put me in a prison is all that you've done we haven't fixed anything here Joab and he tries to get a hold of Joab tries to get Joab to come and see him and he won't do it so Absalom has his servants go and burn the fields of Joab to finally get his attention he said hey you didn't leave me no choice here okay we tried doing this the easy way you wouldn't listen to the easy way I had to get your attention well then Joab arranged the meeting between David and Absalom and then everything's patched up until Absalom tries to take the throne away from David well Joab played peacemaker until things weren't peaceful no more he said okay I tried that thing that David you know talked about called forgiveness and I tried to patch this up and then he still tried to steal the throne away from David he said fine I forgave you you rejected it you made a mess of it it's time for you to die he had standing orders the king told him don't kill my son what did he do killed his son why well because Joab was all all for it when David was the one that had been done wrong yeah David I understand Absalom did wrong he killed somebody he ran away I'm going to get this all patched up for you David but when after they get things made up he says alright hey we got Absalom back right everything's not perfect but he's back he's on our side and then he's made a fool of because Absalom really wasn't for David really wasn't trying to get back 
and patch everything up, he was trying to steal the throne from his dad. And when Joab was made to look a fool, he said, all right, I'm going to teach him. Yeah, yeah, David, I'll make sure not to kill him. Kills him. He says, that'll teach you. But see, Joab was fine living for God until the sacrifice started. Joab was fine living for God until he was the one that got hurt. David got hurt. All right, hey, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to get this patched up. But then he gets hurt and he retaliates against what the man of God told him to do. And then finally, we get to, we got to hurry up. We get to the third chapter of Joab's life where he's siding against Solomon. Well, why is he doing that? Because David took away his position, his notoriety. He said, hey, you've disobeyed me for the last time, Joab. I forgave you the first two times, not this time. And he says, I'm going to replace you with Abishai. That brother of yours that, you know, fought half of the enemy that one day when you were surrounded. The one that's been with me just as long as you, but he's never disobeyed me. And he says, I'm taking away your position, taking away your notoriety. He had no influence in the community no more. What did he have? He had his deeds. He was humiliated because he had humiliated himself. But David called him on it and took away his position. And then he's sitting over in the corner waiting for David to die and saying, I'm going to teach David. I don't care who David wants on the throne. I'm going to put who I want on the throne. Because if I put who I want on the throne, I can be general again. I can have my position. It, people are fine living forgotten until they have to give up their identity. We have to submit. I must decrease. He must increase. Right? The old man's crucified. He dead. I'm the new creature that God made me into. Well, Joab would say, I'll live for God as long as I can still be general. As long as people still salute me when I walk down the street. As long as people in the community come and ask me for advice because I'm close to the king. But when all that was taken away, I'll show them. I'll wait. I'll bide my time. I'll get my revenge, is what he's thinking. Well, he didn't. What happened? Solomon's the next one on the throne. Joab's dead. All because of why? Because in his heart, he didn't understand what love, forgiveness, kindness. I doubt that he had much joy in his life. Because he holds on to grudges for a long time. I doubt that he had many long lasting relationships. Because if somebody does them wrong, he cuts them out. Okay, I doubt that when everything went upside down and he didn't know what to do, I doubt he turned to God. More likely, he's trying to figure out how Joab can fix the situation. God was his father. He was one of God's chosen people, but he had nothing to do with God. Contrast that to David. When David was just a shepherd out there keeping his father's sheep, he's still out there singing praises to God. When David's on the throne, he's still singing praises. Was he perfect? No. But when he sinned, he got it made right. Was he, you know, always in the throne room singing praises? No. When he's in the caves, he's still praising and worshiping God. With a broken heart, he's you know fearful in the flesh. He said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe that God's going to work it out. Where do you think David learned to forgive? You think it was maybe in that time where God gave him refuge in the middle of the Philistines? That was his enemy. God turned him into an ally. And David realized when he's in that camp, those people that at one point were against me, they were just doing what they thought was best. They didn't know any better. But if I get an opportunity to show them the true way, I will forgive them for God's sake. So that we can move together for God. Then he gets on the throne. What do he do? He has a forgiving and a loving heart. Joab didn't. Joab never wanted to forgive. Joab never wanted to continue a relationship with God. Joab wasn't concerned what the commandment says as long as it made him feel better. Now, all that being said, what did it cost Joab? Everything. 
How much of an impact did he have on the plan that God had laid out? Zero. Everything that God desired to happen still happened. But think of all that joy. I mean, he's a motivated man. He's an intelligent man. He wasn't the greatest general in the world. It's not like he came up with a whole bunch of great battle strategies, but he was a proven man of battle. But he did win some significant battle because God wanted him to. But in his mind, he thought, man, I'm a great leader. Think if he took all of that and gave it all to God, how great God could have made him. But he didn't. Well, what do Christians nowadays, well, nowadays, when they get in the Bible and they realize, well, if I want to get closer to God, I'm going to have to give this up, they don't want it. When they get hurt, they say, all right, it's time to get revenge. And then, finally, when they lose a little bit of notoriety, well, no, I want people to know that I'm the one that did this. Well, you didn't do it. God did it. Well, I want people to come and ask me for advice. Well, they'd be better off going to God for advice. But see, nowadays, if people don't get the credit, if they don't get the pat on the back, then it upturns their apple cart. And they say, fine, you don't want to give me the credit, I'll take the credit for myself. And you can trace it all back to one thing. What's that? It's a heart problem. It didn't start when Joab killed Abner. It started long before that when Joab said, they did David wrong, they did me wrong, I'm out here living in a cave with David. We're going to get back to Jerusalem and we're going to sort all this out. But Joab thought he could sort it out instead of God sorting it out. Well, what's the contrast to that? Benaiah. Uriah the Hittite. Men that didn't do it because they wanted the position. They did it because they loved the man of God. They loved God. And they were going to do what was right. Those mighty men. David's on his deathbed. He said, man, I wish I could have a taste of water from the well. Over there by this particular gate. What'd they do? They fought Philistines all the way there and all the way back just to get a cup of water for the man of God. Why? Because they loved God's man and they loved God. And they said, doesn't matter. Our life's not important. If God's man wants something, we're going to do it. But if God wants it done, he can take whatever he wants to from me. If I've got to be embarrassed, if I've got to get you know, scraped up or hurt, if I've got to be made an example of in the eyes of the world so that God can prove he's bigger than the world, okay. Because if God gets the glory for it, it's all that matters. By the way, David didn't drink that water. He poured it out as an offering unto God. They said, Lord, thank you for men that love you enough and love me enough, not just to protect me, but Lord, they go through all of this just to make me happy on my deathbed. And he poured out their efforts, their sacrifice, what they brought back as an offering unto God, and God honored it. How do you know? It's in the Bible. Stands as a testament of something that somebody didn't have to do, but they wanted to do it. Well, Joab, all he wanted to do was what Joab wanted to do. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.